incredibly brave, um, incredible Sunitha Krishnan, uh, anti-trafficking activist. I'm Elise Nelson. I'm president and CEO of Vital Voices. I'm thrilled to be back at Women in the World and, of course, to be with Sunitha, who we've worked with for the last decade. Um, 22 years ago, 22 years ago, she started in this journey. 22 years ago, there were no laws on the books in any country to protect the victims or put the bad guys behind bars on this issue of human trafficking. 22 years ago, there were no international treaties or protocols. And in fact, 22 years ago, let's face it, quite frankly, many of us in this room didn't even know ourselves about the issue of human trafficking. 22 years ago is when Sunitha began working on the issue, began to stem the tide of human trafficking. As you saw in the film, she has rescued 20,000 women and children. Um, she has actually... Probably even more important, if you can believe it than that, is that she has really worked to put the traffickers behind bars, getting 1,600 convictions. <laughs> She's trained 25,000 police officers, 10,000 uh, lawyers. I mean, she is a one-woman crusader. And what I know about Sunitha is that this is a very personal mission uh, for her. And I wonder, Sunitha, if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about how you began your work two decades ago. I was 15, Alice, when I was gang raped by eight men. I think the rape per se doesn't uh, haunt me as such, as much as the, the shame, the guilt, the exclusion, the stigma that I was subjected to. I was made to feel like a criminal for a crime that I've never committed. I think the unfairness of that, the anger in me, is what is my driving force from then to now. Mm. And uh, very shockingly and surprisingly, even after 26 years, that anger is not gone. The numbers of children who are raped just Three days back, an eight-year-old child was raped by gang raped in a temple in India. The numbers are just growing, and my anger is growing. That started me, that drives me, that sustains me. So just on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you are a target from these traffickers, obviously, because they make a lot of money. You know, they have very strong motivations. Um, and you believe very strongly that you've got to stand up not just to rescue the victims, but also to put these bad guys behind bars. So you're under threat because of that. Is that why this incident just happened? Um, I think, you know, it, it is a common uh, common sense to understand that if you're destroying somebody's business, you're destroying somebody's livelihood, they're not going to be happy with you. Um, every child that I rescue, if it's the youngest child that I've rescued is three and a half years old from a brothel. Um, a 10-year-old child is supposed to sleep with 40 men a day. Every man fetches that kind of money. So if you have 40 girls in a brothel, that's the kind of revenue you're destroying when you actually remove them out of that place of exploitation. So obviously, they are not too happy about me. They have been doing everything possible to, to, uh, to uh, destroy me and wipe me out. There was a time that uh, they, they instigated the community around me and uh, got my shelters evicted. Um, three of my shelters located. In, in different parts of the city was evicted because the community felt that we are polluting the place there. And there was this whole world of hostility created around us. Uh, thanks to Vital Voices, Diane von Fristenberg, my guardian angel and friend, Tina Brown, we were able to create a safe shelter for, for, for these children. But unfortunately, those shelters are not safe anymore. Yeah. 
We've been having a new trend of attacks now. Uh, in the last four years, we've had three such attacks, and the most recent one was on the 21st of February. So this when, one, I just want to stop you. This one, I, I mean, in the time that I've known you, you have been attacked personally 19 times. Yeah. Acid attacks, um, people trying to run you off the road. But what's different about this attack and why it's so scary is that the six young women that perpetrated this crime came into your shelter as victims, Absolutely. but they were plants from the traffickers. I think that was what was very shocking. Um, uh, and this has not happened. This is not the first time. This is the third time in the last four years where traffickers and very young traffickers, women traffickers, have posed as victims and infiltrated into the shelter and engineered an attack from inside. They vandalized my place. They took glasses, broke glasses, took the glasses and stabbed my staff. One of my staff had 26 stitches in her stomach. In the last two months, we haven't slept because we, we could identify six of them. They were arrested and put in the jail. So, but when the police were, was investigating and interrogating them, uh, they said about six more people inside. And those six more are still inside my shelter. Wow. And we can't do a thing about them. Wait, because, why can't you do a thing about them? Because they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. Mm. We don't know what their master plan is. My, my people tell me not to come to the shelter because they think that the staff that went into the stomach of another staff of mine was actually meant for me. And these six are waiting for me. Somehow, it is a very scary situation where my children today have to witness blood, glass pieces everywhere. People are so scared. We don't know who is next, sitting next to you. And it, it breaks my heart that we save heaven, that I, I, I wanted so much for my children. It's no more safe. Yeah. And that, I can't tell you how gut-wrenching that is. And today, I'm, I'm so distressed. Lastly, because just two hours back, a child in my, in my shelter, and every girl in my shelter is a daughter to me, 20-year-old girl, committed suicide. She hanged herself to death, meaning this is just not ending for us. We've never seen a suicide. So there is attack from outside, there is attack from inside. They're just making our life miserable at this moment. So how do we get ahead of the traffickers? I mean, they are nimble, they adapt, they're highly motivated, they're well-networked, they're well-financed. They're always one step ahead. But, but we are not. But how, how, do we, how do we get ahead? I think the greatest tragedy of this world today is the good of the world are never organized. We sit here in these nice, wonderful halls, listen to all these wonderful stories. We are oh, ah, ooh, and we give the right kind of applause when it is required. But will we stand up and get organized against these criminals? They are far ahead of us. 40 million people in slavery today, 18 million people in India. Technology is aggravating the crime. We are still sensitizing people about this. While the cram criminals are far ahead, hundreds and thousands of lives are destroyed. And I want to ask each one of us, how many more before yeah. we stand up? Do you think the problem's getting worse? Because, I mean, today, unlike when you started 22 years ago, we have laws on the books, right? We didn't have that. So there's 124 countries around the world who've got laws on the books that criminalizes human trafficking today, 150 countries that have laws to protect the victims. Why is it getting worse? I think technology has been a great uh, boost to the crime. It has made the crime more faceless, more classless, no borderless. You know, once upon a time, when I started 22 years back, um, it was not very difficult to identify the profile of a victim. It would be somebody poor, a Dalit, a tribal girl, somebody from a very economically vulnerable group. But today, you will see even middle-class girls in, 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 thing, uh, in, in you know, sex traffic uh, through grooming, manipulation, social engineering. 
but young girls, 12 and 13 year olds, who are actually being groomed through social media and then put into cyber pornography, cyber trafficking. So today, more than ever, this crime has become faceless, more clandestine. And what bothers me is that half the people in this audience will not even believe that their own children are vulnerable to this crime. They're still in a state of yeah. denial. Right. And that is the tragedy of us. Mm. You know, while the others are conspiring to, to bring as many people in, we are just waiting for this to happen to our own daughter. Will it make any difference that India is now looking at a law in the books? Will that make any difference for your work? As you said, 18 million people today enslaved in India. That's half of the global population that are enslaved or enslaved in India. So is that going to make a difference? I fought for 14 years to get this legislation. It is my public interest litigation that has now brought this, bringing us this legislation. It is in the parliament, and I'm hoping that by the next parliament session, this parliament session, as you know about India, uh, did not have any working time at all. They were fighting among each other so much that they didn't take up any bill. But we are hoping that at least in the next parliament session, the bill will be passed. But if it is, gets passed, at least on paper, for the first time, we have a commitment from the government saying that we recognize this as an organized crime. We recognize this as a crime where we want to invest our budgets in. Mm -hmm. We recognize this as a crime where victims have to be given all protection. So that will be the first acknowledgement of its kind in India. And I think that will be a very, very important statement for the mission. You've talked about the feminization uh, of, of criminality. Explain that. I think no other crime uh, other than sex trafficking has the highest number of women who are the face of the crime. From the, the face of the crime? Absolutely. Not the victims, the no. face of the crime. Face of the, also the victim and the crime. The primary procurer who lures a young girl from a village on the promise of a job, on the promise of marriage, or on the promise of a better opportunity, is invariably a known woman. The middle chain must be some men coming in between. But the brothel keeper, the madam, the supervisor, the person who's controlling the whole place is again a woman. The traffickers who are infiltrating into my shelter and causing such huge damage are also women. And, and you can't imagine the ruthlessness with which they do it. But this time, they targeted my crash, meaning I have little babies there, one, one year old baby and sev seven months and six months babies of the victims there, 26 of them. They targeted those children, you know. So that is how ruthless the criminal force is. And very unfortunately, they now are you, women. You mentioned that you've trained uh, 25,000, or I, I mentioned, but I know this from you, that you've trained 25,000 police officers. But I know that sometimes the police aren't always on your side. So what, what is their role in this? I think anywhere in the world, it's not just India. An organized crime like human trafficking cannot exist with the, without the active connivance of the system. The system, there is leakage in our system. Everywhere in the world, there is corruption. Everywhere in the world. And that is perhaps why this crime thrives. Any brothel in India is, is patronized by some section of the police, mm -hmm. not all sections. There are good policemen, there are excellent officers, but there are also infiltrators among them who are part of the crime. But the police also send you the, the, the victims, yes? They are the ones who are the frontliners for the rescue. But I must tell you, Elise, it's very difficult to make out, because even as a practitioner, for me, it takes me a month to actually make out that there's something different about this person. During a rescue, when it is so much of chaos, it is very, very difficult to make out who's a victim and who's a trafficker, mm -hmm. especially if that person is very young. I have a 19-year-old trafficker, meaning how young is that? So, you know, uh, it, it, is, it is not very easy to, so I can't blame them for actually, you know, 
fixing traffickers and putting them inside my shelter. Um, they're doing what they can after the crime is done. But we are the ones who are bearing the nightless, you know, sleepless nights. We are the ones who are paranoid every time looking behind our back to see somebody's going to stab us. Um, I, I don't like putting my children into so much of pain and, mm -hmm. and fear. I think there's a, there's a misconception often about a victim. Um, I think people often believe that, you know, a brothel is raided and girls are taken to your shelter and that they want to be there, they want to be saved, but yet they're often so broken down that they, they, they actually want to leave the shelter. Um, explain that a little bit, the kind of trauma that goes on. Most often, uh, at least by the time they are rescued, and only hardly 7% of them get ever rescued, uh, they have been raped by thousands of men. They've already started surviving in the experience of being exploited. They have started normalizing the experience of exploitation. So by the time you, you get this person out, she actually believes that that hell is better than this shelter. And she actually looks at me as an abuser who's removing her from her safe sp space. By this time, she also has Stockholm Syndrome, so she's attached to the abuser. She thinks that the abuser who's taking care of her, loving her, providing that little space of intimacy. So the first few months in my few weeks in my shelter is, is dealing with hostile victims, people who are self-harming themselves, harming others, trying to escape the shelter. And then there's a whole lot of them sitting outside my gate, creating hell for me, trying to take these girls out of my place because they are losing their livelihood. Because every minute spent in my shelter is loss of livelihood for many others outside. So it's kind of a very, very vitriolic situation this way and that way. And most people don't understand that. People, people think just making one donation sometimes solves yeah. the problem. We are living and sustaining those safe shelters, meaning every day we have to live with this and half of them are HIV positive. So if I'm not doing any of this, I'm cremating dead bodies. Nothing else, you know, and even in dead bodies, I, I, I don't get a cremation ground easily because it's a HIV positive dead body. So for every step, we have to take that extra mile to do things, you know, so yeah, it's... it's just, to, just to give you a, a sense of what Sunitha deals with on a daily basis, I remember when I first met her, she was telling me that 98% of the children, very young, as young as like three months old, who come into her shelter, 98% are HIV positive. And I thought, oh, is it passed from their mother? Why are they HIV positive? And she said, no, it's because they were trafficked at three months old, three raped, years old. Three raped years at old. three years old. Um, and I just think about how you carry that weight on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's truly something I can't ever fathom. I think uh, the smile on my children's faces when they recover and gain back their dignity, that keeps me going. But before I end, I think the time is getting over, so I want to say one thing to all the traffickers out there. I know they're watching me now. I just want to tell them that you can't wipe us out. The war is on. Even if I'm not there, if I'm, even if I'm dead and gone, there are many others who will continue the fight. There are warriors who will wipe this slavery out, and you cannot wipe us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.